Good evening, everybody. Welcome back to the master class for a special Tuesday night edition. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Josh, how are you, my friend? I'm great. How are you? Um, I'm okay. I'm surviving. Uh, I apologize to everybody. It's my fault uh, that we're here on Tuesday <laughs> night instead of Monday night. Obviously, you could see I'm not in Dubro headquarters. Uh, I'm actually coming live to you from a hotel room in Las Vegas from a trade show. But we wanted the class to go on, so we're making this work. So, Miracle of modern technology. I love it. <laughs> exactly, exactly. <laughs> so we apologize for the day delay. Uh, I was stuck in a trade show yes, or last evening, so... Uh, tonight ended a little early, so I was able to jump on, and we got Josh in the house to uh, show us some cool stuff tonight. Um, already okay. the comments are dropping in, so guys, gals, drop in where you're tuning in from. Uh, we love to see where everybody's watching live from, but uh, first comment of the night was Rob from Indianapolis just bought tool supplies, but hasn't built yet. Loving the classes. And uh, already we got New Mexico, Ohio, Lancaster, Virginia, uh, all in the house. So awesome. it's good to see everybody tonight. Uh, Sioux Falls, South Dakota. Um, man, it's great to, great to see everybody. Some familiar faces from pre previous classes. Yeah, if this is. is the first one you guys are joining in on, welcome, welcome. So Josh... What are we talking about tonight, my man? Well, thanks. Uh, we're going to do something that uh, is getting toward the end of the, what I call the end of the building. Um, at this point, we've covered a lot of the building techniques that are pretty much all covering every aspect of this particular build. Uh, what was the first thing that we covered, Brian, that you demonstrated so well? <laughs> to use wax paper on your plants <laughs> that is absolutely correct <laughs> hey we there is a reason why i didn't use wax paper <laughs> uh yeah so uh we covered building the wing and the basic techniques involved there we also talked about uh, the sandwiching technique that's involved in building the horizontal stabilizer and the rudder and vertical stabilizer, which I've got here. Uh, we also talked a little bit about uh, the fuselage construction. Now, last time, if you recall, we built essentially this, right? Right. Mm -hmm. And when you go a few steps further, you eventually get to this. <laughs> so you that. essentially take the two halves and you lay them vertically over the plan and you start connecting the two halves together. You start with the bottom right here and you just build it up and do one step at a time, just like everything else. And all of the skills involved in building this, you've already learned. So that's why I went ahead and started constructing this. Uh, the only exception, the only exception I would say is the sheeting of the hatch. Sure. Now, to cover the hatch, it's actually a lot simpler than you might think to get wood to bend. Uh, Brian, how do you think you get wood to bend like this? Remember, it's soft balsa. It's very porous. Make it a little damp. Yeah. Yeah. So wet wood bends a lot. <laughs> mm -hmm. And in this particular case, I use Windex. The reason I use Windex is because the ammonia base rather than water base, it tends to soften the fibers faster and evaporate faster than water. Right. Okay. So uh, really what you have to remember is that you're doing this essentially one half at a time right? Uh, so you, you cover uh, the, the whole thing, but it's, you, you spray the, the Windex on the outside of the wood so that it will bend and then you'll have the dry portion on the underside. And that way, I like to tack it in position with CA glue, Okay. right? And mm -hmm. then on the bottom side, 
if you can see, you go in with your glue and you can do proper gluing on the seams from the inside. And that's really it. And then once it's all there, uh, you, you're gonna go over like this part. I had the balsa wood extended here. And then you just sand it with your quick sand hand sander. It's like really, it. it's really that easy. And then we can just use a uh, covering or stain or whatever you want to do on the top side to finish the wood out. And that's the hatch. Like it. So tonight, what we're going to do is we're going to talk about iron on covering. Now, uh, Brian, you've, you've seen a, a few of my models, right? Yes, sir. How many of them uh, are covered in iron on covering? Not very many. No. I don't think. No. Why do you think that is? Because <laughs> it's not the easiest thing in the world to do. <laughs> it's not for me. <laughs> okay. I'll just say that. I am not the world's best covering person. I can do it sufficiently, uh, but I am by no means an expert. There are plenty of tutorials out there, both written and in video. Um, and what I'd like to do tonight is just cover some of the basics. I'm not going to get into okay. anything too terribly fancy or advanced, but it will be enough to get you started, get your feet wet, make a few mistakes, and learn from them. Uh, you will be able to recover from these mistakes, right? So uh, really, really what's important to understand is that you will make mistakes on this, right? Uh, but don't be afraid. Uh, it's just an iron-on covering. It's, it's applied with heat. Uh, so the safety thing for tonight is hot things are hot. Mm -hmm. Don't burn yourself. Okay. Uh, so tools tonight. Tools are trusty razor blade, scissors. Uh, I've got a Sharpie as well. Uh, I have a, a covering iron. Now, a covering iron it comes in many different flavors. The particular one that I'm using is the Hanger 9. There's also a, 20, a Coverite 21st century covering, covering iron. I prefer any covering iron where you can actually set the temperature, not just have a number dial, you know, one to 10. Uh, if you can get the temperature, you can have a better sense right off the bat of where you need to set the dial for your specific covering. Um, and see other tools. Oh, heat gun. So this is just a cheap heat gun from Harbor Freight. Uh, it works for me. Uh, but you do need a heat gun. A hair dryer, not really going to work that well for this. It can work for some iron-on coverings, but not for the particular covering that we will be using tonight. Uh, but just do yourself a favor, uh, save yourself the headache, and just upfront buy a heat gun for this. So... Um, Let's see. Uh, do you remember the material that we're going to cover with? Do you remember what it's called? That's uh, the Oritex, correct? Yeah. Have you ever heard of that material before? Not until you told me to order it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So Oritex. Um, Oritex is this lovely stuff. I don't know if you can see. Probably you can see a little bit here. Uh, it's... It's somewhat transparent, like or translucent. It lets some of the light through. And that's really cool because it's kind of a scale detail, right? Mm -hmm. um, a lot of these old vintage looking airplanes, they were fabric covered and you could see light pass through and see the structure skeleton of the airplane, which is kind of cool, right? Uh, what's great about Oratex too is that it's got this kind of fabric look to it up close. Uh, it's it's hard to see on camera. It kind of looks like a thin canvas, right? It, it does, it does. Uh, I'm gonna change my camera here real quick and I have another sample that's in yellow because the the white you can't really see up close the camera doesn't really focus on it well you can focus a little sure. bit better and see that it 
it has a, a canvas texture to it, right? And we want that because these these models were or these airplanes were covered in this linen material that was pulled tight and then it was doped or treated in some way to strengthen it, make it more rigid, but it was still relatively lightweight. And so that's what we're trying to replicate. And in doing so, we have this really nice feature where you have a heat activated adhesive. Now, years ago, you okay. used to have to paint the adhesive onto your wood and then put the material and then iron it. But this is like an all-in-one solution. And the bad thing about Oratex is that it's heavy. All right. So in terms of iron on coverings, it's about the heaviest one that you can get. Now, what does that mean for us? Well, I've done the math, a lot of math. <laughs> you can get numbers out there for, you know, the, the weight per square foot per square yard and uh, do back calculations and figure out what's the rough area. So what can I roughly estimate the weight? For the size of our model, it's an acceptable amount of weight for the detail that we want to accomplish. And that's how I choose my details that I want to put into a model, which is sort of a prelude for future episodes that we're going to do here. Um, but I wanted to at least be upfront about that, that this is not necessarily the end all be all. It is a little bit more expensive than the typical film coverings. Um, but by no means is it you know, the one solution that you have to do. It is the solution that I chose for this project given the scale attributes that we're trying to emulate. Does that make Got sense, it. Brian? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Um, Any questions? We, yes, we got two questions before we dive into it. Uh, Todd asks, are the trim irons available anymore? They have a small tip for getting into tight areas. Top flight sold one years ago. You know, I don't know. Um, again, because I don't do uh, iron-on coverings very often, I don't have a trim iron, and I haven't looked for one. <laughs> um, let, we could probably do a Google, so Google search yeah. really quick on the yeah. Horizon website because they would be yep. probably the one supplier that would have it. Yeah, um, I can do that real quick. And yeah, then, so a, um, a trim iron has just a tiny little, as opposed to a large head like this, it has a tiny little head for just doing little tiny seams or pinstripes, just so that people it. who don't know what those are. Got it. Um, and then the other question was from our good friend Gary, who's, uh, this is his first build. He says he's almost got the wing done. He says, building the wing, I have some CA drip down and stick to the wax paper. Will that cause, will that CA cause a problem with the covering sticking? Is sanding it good enough? No, the CA will be just fine. If you sand it, the, uh, I mean, you're going to, you're going to be sanding anyway. So sanding it will be just fine. Uh, any exposed glue, even if it's an aliphatic glue, the covering will stick to that as well. The wax paper might be a little bit questionable. I would definitely, if it, there's still wax paper there, try to sand that away. Okay. Okay. So, Gary, All right. I hope that answers so your shall question. We, shall we dig into this? Let, let's do it. Okay. So. Uh, the first thing that you need to go through and do is sand. <laughs> uh, I'm using little sanding pads that I picked up at Walmart. This is uh, the Gator brand, um, and they're called contour pads, and you can pick them up for just a couple of dollars. This one's medium. Uh, they also have coarse and fine. Um, but yeah, it's just a just a foam pad mostly because the foam helps to give an even distribution of pressure as you sand. You don't necessarily want to use straight up sanding paper. You have to be a little bit more careful because when you sand like this, you've got like three different pressure points from your fingers, right? So if you're sanding something, it's not gonna be even. So take the sanding pad and then you're gonna want to even out every edge 
just make them flat because you're human and they're not going to be aligned perfectly on every edge. So start with that, just make them flat. And then you're going to want to round off the corners. How much you round off is really up to you. There's really no said fast rule. Aerodynamically, I've seen it all. I've seen really sharp edges and I've seen people like try to bevel everything so it's airfoil. They all fly the same <laughs> in, in reality. For the scale that we're going here, just rounding off the corners, making it look as nice as possible is the name of the game. So if you notice, I've got these two parts here. And the reason for that is that I have hinges in here. I'm using the Dubro, uh, the Dubro small nylon pin hinges. And uh, I think that's a good segue, don't you think, Brian? Absolutely. Um, first question of the night, boys and girls, to win some Dubro nylon hinges, um, we will do, what, should we do the second question first? We can. I think so. Yeah. In glow, in glow powered aircraft require a special fixture in the fuel tank that keeps the fuel supply inlet submerged in the fuel so it does not pull air into the fuel line regardless of the plane's altitude um what is the name of the device oh i didn't even finish peter got it <laughs> it is it is the clunk peter sent us a message at orders at dubro.com and uh, leave your shipping info and uh, if you want standard or small hinges and we'll get a pack sent out to you. Yeah. We also have the large scale hinges too. Uh, yep. So what, whatever you need for your shop, let us know. Yep, absolutely. Cool. Well, that was fast, Peter. Yeah. <laughs> Sutter family said, Peter is fast. <laughs> Indeed. Indeed. All right. So the the last thing that I do before I start covering is if I have a control surface, I need to bevel the control surface. So let me switch my camera view here. And I'll show you exactly what I mean. So when you have a control surface, so here's the rudder and this is the vertical stabilizer, you're going to be bending like this, right? So if you have a small gap for the hinge on the pin in the hinge, you have to have a little bit of a relief. And so you can see this is a, like triangulated here. And that's just simply done by taking your sandpaper or your sand, uh, your sand pad here and running it along. And I don't go straight across. I go down and across almost at a diagonal. And the reason I do this, I do it one at a time. I don't just go like this is because if you get into one spot, it's more difficult to blend. The other really great tool to use is obviously a quicksand hand sander because it can cover the entire length of it all in one go. And you can just keep on going as you need to. So that's what the can sanders are great for. And of course, the 22 inch one is great for doing leading edges of wings and stuff like that. So with that said, once you have your part sanded, ready to go, it's nice and smooth. We've got, uh, we've got some covering to do. So I have a cutting mat here so that I'm not cutting on the plans, but I wanted the white because it's a little bit nicer for, you know, the, the ugliness that is my building bench here. Uh, but we need to have a piece cut roughly to size, but we want some overage. So I am going to go ahead and just roughly line this up. And again, I'm not going with any given amount. And what we're gonna do first is we're gonna tack in place. Now, the way that I learned to cover and the way that I've seen covered, what works for me is what I'm trying to say, is I wrap around any of the flat edges. So see how there is a curved edge here, here, 
and there's a flat one here. So I am going to try to tack here on this edge and then have it wrap around like a Christmas present along that flat edge. So let's start. We're going to line it up. And again, you want overage on everything. And the first thing you want to do is tack down just the middle on your first edge. So that way it's nice and stuck down. And then you can work from the middle out to stick it down on everything else. Now, what I want to show you on purpose is how sloppy that is. And I didn't get the edge right, right here. There's, there's very little overage, okay? So now what I'm gonna do, it's not the end of the world. I'm gonna take my heat gun, I'm gonna set it on low, let it heat up a little bit, and I'm just gonna lightly heat it up and pull at the same time. And it peels up. So now this time, when I lay it down, I'm gonna be a little more careful about centering it and making sure that I've got plenty of overage and do the same thing. You with me so far, Brian? Yes, sir. I, I started getting anxiety when you compared it to a wrapping presents because I'm horrible at that. <laughs> Come on, you just got tutoring during Christmas season, right? Trust me, it wasn't pretty, my friend. It was not pretty at all. <laughs> um, so Horizon or Tower does not have a heat iron. However, they do have a heat gun for $22.99. Hmm. Interesting. So, um, but I did do a Google search, and uh, a few different irons did pull up. Um, so there are irons out there. And specifically, some of the ones um, have a smaller point that you can add on to it to get into those hard to reach places that okay. uh, Todd was talking about. It was Todd. Very yes. good. So. Cool. Well, thanks for looking that up, man. Yeah, no sweat. So watching here, I'll just explain real quick that I'm, again, working from the inside, the middle of the part and working out. So I'm moving forward and working out. And I'm, I'm just trying like to tack it down to the wood frame. Sorry. It's kind of like putting a sticker on your car, right? You want to work, work out yeah. so that way you're not getting air bubbles, right? Right, right. And the, the benefit of covering wood is that you're not necessarily going to have air bubbles with this. I mean, the, you can get air bubbles with some of the other plastic coverings, but generally you don't uh, with this unless you're dealing with really large uh, sheeted surfaces. Sure, 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 sure. All right. So we are now covered on one side. So what I do is I take this leading edge and I go right up to the very edge of it. You can't see that. This edge, and I'm going to cut right like that. And I'm going to do that on both sides. So now I have a little cut in my covering like that. Got it. So what we're going to do now is we're going to learn about how elastic this stuff becomes when it gets hot. Uh, so I currently have my iron set at 280 degrees. And that is what I have found to be a good uh, tacking temperature. Um, Oratex does come with directions and they have their own um, their own recommendations. and. They work for some people. Uh, I try to do test patches to make sure that what works for me works and works consistently. So your mileage may vary. So now what I like to do is I like to work on the corners first uh, because this involves a lot of stretching. So I apologize. Let me let me try to get this down angled a little bit better so that you can see. Um, but see how 
this looks kind of flat and you're like, well, how does that work? Sure. But as you as you round up and you get the heat close to it, you can pull and tack and then pull and tack and it stretches as the heat goes. And you can blow on a little bit to help accelerate cooling so that it sticks more in place. And then once I have it roughly tacked in place, I try to inspect it. I don't try to rush this. Don't go too fast. Because once you start stretching it, you're starting to deform the surface and it's going to be a little bit more difficult to recover. Uh, also, a side note, this stuff really does like to stick to itself once it gets hot, so be careful of that too. And then this other corner, we're going to do the exact same thing. Just heat a little bit at the time, try to roll things around, pull, stretch. So why, why do the corners first before doing that leading edge? Um, for me, I find that by having the corner on its own without having this edge like flipped up, it gives me more freedom to move around and shift the material around the corner. Okay. So it's, it's less restrictive for me and how I try to approach. So sure. then, for example, since I have both of these uh, corners done now, I can just make a couple of passes along to help seal this edge. Got it. And it'll start to shrink as well. You see a little bit of wrinkling here on uh -huh. this corner, but we'll, we'll get there. I, I Trust me, trust the process. So I trust you thing. over me, my friend, so. <laughs> I'm just thinking about how burnt my fingertips are going to be after I get done doing this. Yeah. Well, again, that's why you don't want to use excessive heat on this. <laughs> um, I mean, it's still hot. It's going to burn you. All right. So now we've got all of this excess, right? All of this overage. And so what I do is I have a nice, clean pair of scissors. You don't want any gunk or stuff on the blades that can stick to it. And obviously, you want to make sure that they're sharp, but then you just trim the excess. Drop, this part, drop it down a little bit. You're out of frame, my friend. Oh, sorry. Thank you. Thank there you. you. Go. That's why I have you. I'm your extra set of eyes, my friend. That's true. I don't want to cut myself. All right. So this doesn't have to be too terribly pretty in terms of the cut. You can see it's a little bit jaggy here, but that's all right. So now we're going to go back with our covering iron and tack this corner all the way up. I'm going to roll it around and make sure it's nice and sealed up against the wood. And the cool thing is, again, because this stuff is so stretchy, you can actually take the covering iron and as you push along it, you can see that it softens and you can smooth out wrinkles to a certain extent. Oh, very cool. The Oratex is very, very forgiving in this way, which is part of the reason why I recommend it uh, because it makes people like me who aren't very good at this look like pros. We'll just say that. <laughs> right on. <laughs> All right. So uh, trying to get this a little bit in frame. So uh, uh, we got yeah. a question, and, sure. and I'm curious as well, because as I was searching irons, uh, uh, our friend Gary says, do you not use a sock over the iron? Yeah, that I forgot to mention that, actually. Thank you for bringing that up. I have a sock here to show you that, yes, this is a sock. For me, personally, when I work with Oratex, I find that the sock is um, annoying. <laughs> uh, the reason is that the sock, because of the softness of the fibers, when you run it over, it's, it's like rough. 
it, it, because of the texture of the Oratex, it, it feels like I'm scraping it. And uh, when I when I go to flatten it out, it, it almost feels like it's uh, being smeared. Uh, so I don't much care for the finish that it leaves on the Oratex. Yes, on like uh, uh, other film coverings that are glossy, you're gonna wanna use the sock. Uh, and I have actually used baby socks before. <laughs> <laughs> they do. Okay. They do. They do work in a pinch, and they will fit over top. Uh, you just have to make sure that your your dial is set before you slide the sock over top. It 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 does work. It, it's a cheaper <laughs> alternative. It does work. <laughs> I like it. All right. So now we're just going to move along, and we're going to oh, one more thing. So we have our hinges here, right? So before we cover this. We want to see where we're going to put our hinges. Yes, so I'm uh, going to yeah, take right. my marker and just make a mark in the wood that is rather unobtrusive. Just like that. There's nothing too heavy handed. And now we're going to cover. A couple of passes, make sure it's smooth and then move along. Maybe raise your camera up slightly, Josh. Maybe I should, yeah. You did Thank angle you. it down a little bit. There you go. All right, so now we're going to do the same cut here. Cut there. So now we have this cool little flag. This little flag right here, all right? We're just going to tack these over for now. as straight as you can. And they just have to be tacked. We would just want them mostly out of the way. They don't have to be perfectly sealed. And now we're gonna do the same thing on this side. We're gonna try to use the excess and pull, keep tension to keep as minimal wrinkles as possible. Again, start at the middle work your way out. Someone have a question? Yeah, so Rick is asking, or, or says he likes to use adhesive, like six sticks it, or mm -hmm. polytack on the frame before covering with Oratex or monocoat. Seems that the covering stays down better long-term. Your thoughts? Um, sure. I think that uh, the extra glue can't hurt in terms of keeping the covering down. Um, my personal opinion, this is just an opinion, is that the weight penalty is not worth the insurance. I would rather go back with, a, with an iron and touch up something that has come a little bit loose uh, than pay the weight penalty on an overall airframe to make sure that I never have to touch it ever again. Because to me, that's additional weight that I could use for details, especially when you're dealing with a, a, a piece that's on the tail that you have to then compensate for in the nose. Makes sense. All right, so we're just doing another rough cut here. And then we're doing the exact same thing. On notice, we're overlapping. We're going to overlap and have a, a covering to covering bond here. And that's really what we're after. Because with the bond covering to covering, that's going to help seal out moisture. And in the case of one of these models, it's going to help seal out glow fuel and oil <laughs> because those, gl those glow engines blow oil out of the exhaust and that is not something we want going into our balsa so that is why covering films are a very good thing all right so again, we've got our corners addressed first. 
I'm gonna start working up the side here. And again, this is this is almost a, a cue straight out of flight test in Josh Bixler, where I'm using the table as my friend. And we have something that is fairly respectable around these seams. Okay, we have it in mostly really good condition. And now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna use just like the last inch of my scissors and I'm gonna make small cuts, very small cuts. We wanna to try to keep this as even as possible. And so any of these wrinkles, you wanna kinda of cut around them to make sure that they're even. If you use like long ones, you're gonna end up with a more jagged finish. Now you can use long ones on these straights. But yeah, around these corners, use small, small cuts. All right. So doing a further inspection, you can see around here have you, how you have a much straighter, neater cut. This one's a little bit messy, but here's the magic. Heat. You take heat, and as you roll it around, it melts and it makes things nice and even. It's pretty remarkable. And again, this is just the initial sealing heat. So now that everything is sealed, we're gonna go back and we're really gonna lay down the fire. We're gonna heat it up. I'm turning up my knob to where it says 327 and give that a minute. I think it's time for another giveaway. Did I lose you, Brian? My Maybe apologies. I, I, mute, I muted my mic. I apologize. <laughs> it's um, okay. It happens. I didn't want to. Um, so I found a new question, and I think this is a good one. And we'll give a set of Dubro skis away for this one. Ooh, yay. We're talking propellers. Okay. Propellers for RC aircraft are gener generally a two-bladed, although they're are some that are three or four blades, are selected based on a pair of numbers. Common sizes for sport planes are 10-6, 11-7, 11-6. The first number designates the length of the prop. What is the meaning of the second number? Do, 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 do. <laughs> Steve said length in pitch, and uh, John said pitch. So do we accept length in pitch? Because I mean, it is pitch. The answer is pitch. So they're both right, technically. But the question okay. was asking just for pitch, if you're right. getting down to the nitty gritty. I'll tell you what, Steve Millam and John Sedote, if I butchered your name, I apologize. I'm horrible <laughs> with names. Email me your shipping address uh, at orders at dubro.com and uh, we will get those skis in the mail for you. Nice. Awesome. Skis are honestly one of my favorite <coughs> pieces of hardware this time of year. We covered that last time, but uh, yeah, I'm a little biased. I love snow. Yeah. yeah. All yeah, right. So a little montage of you flying some skis. Yeah. That was actually my club mate. That was his plane. He was oh, flying. That's right. That's right. We met up together and we were having a good time just flying in what snow was left at our field. It was great. Love it. All right. So with the iron set higher, I went ahead and uh, did all of the edges over again, hit some other spots on the flat surfaces that needed a little bit of touch up. You can see there's a little bit of waviness maybe uh, on this surface. Don't worry about that yet. We're almost to that point. 
The last thing we want to do with the ceiling iron is we need to cut openings for our hinges. Remember we made marks. I don't know if you can see it all that well on the camera, but there's a little dark spot right there. Can you see that at all, Brian? Uh, Maybe. Kind of, kind of. All right, well, it is very faint, but it's there. And then there. And then there. Trust me. So I had already pre made those slots for the hinges using the Dubro hinge slaughter. Very handy tool. So the reason I hit that with the iron again is so that you can singe that seam and sort of melt it back and it gives it a cleaner finish for you when you reinsert your hinges. Perfect. Now the last thing we're going to do is we're going to take our heat gun, we're going to set it on high, and we're going to hit this with the high heat, and that's going to take away any of those extra wrinkles that were left over. That's going to tighten this up really nice like a drum, as well as activate any additional adhesive where it's going to be touching any wood. And that's it. We're all set. This piece is done. Now, what's really cool about Oratex is it's also really resistant to chemicals. So if you're going to have like any sort of debris or you've got some residue left on your iron from using another color, you can actually take some acetone and I will even demonstrate this on camera because a lot of people don't believe me. I'm taking straight up acetone and I'm putting it on a paper towel and I am going to rub and it takes away some of the residue that was left on by the covering iron and it just cleans it right up. And if you need to Let's uh, give a little more of an extreme example. Where's my, where's my other little Sharpie? Oh, it's in my, it's in my drawer, maybe? While you're looking for that, we got two questions for you. Sure. Um, Sutter family is asking, um, Josh, you said you did the math. What is the weight penalty using the Oratex? Ah, okay. So that is a very good question because it requires a very technical answer. Uh, do you want the technical answer or do you want me to just ballpark it? Um. <laughs> <laughs> Break it down. Okay, so breaking it down, really what it comes down to is your area, okay? So area is a matter of squares, right? So if you have, if you have, uh, you know, one or two inches squared here, and then all of a sudden you have another inch on a control surface, so say down here, you not, you don't have one more inch. You have two more inches of area, right? So for every additional ounce that you have or half an ounce or whatever, everything is doubled in weight. So it becomes an almost exponential problem. So looking at some of the other film coverings, Oratex can be up to as much as twice as heavy as the other covering films. So doing the math, if you have, you know, three ounces per square yard, uh, you can calculate roughly how much that is, you know, 144 square inches per square foot, because that's 12 times 12, right? And then 12 
times 12 times 12 times 12 times 12 times 12. <laughs> <laughs> That's how many square inches are in a yard, right? A square yard. So it adds up really fast because of the, the rule of squares. So figuring out how much weight per area is a rough calculation. We have the wing area because that's published by Mark at uh, Old School Modern Works. So then you can like take your ruler and you can look at these control surfaces and say, okay, well, I've got this roughly this much area based off of, you know, this measurement and this measurement, this times this is this, and then you do the calculation. You can set up a spreadsheet for it. So it's a, it's a weight penalty that you have to sort of balance and it sort of depends on the size of the model. If you're going anything about 50 or so inches, 50, 55 inches, I would not recommend this material at all uh, just because of that weight. It's going to be very difficult to overcome the tail weight, uh, especially on like a World War I scale model like this, because you have a very short nose moment that you're going to have to add a whole lot of weight to overcome that weight on the tail. Four eyes FPV says compounding interest. <laughs> yes, think of it as that because interest will get you. It never sleeps. <laughs> um, the second question we had, uh, Gary asked, any particular reason why you put hinges in before heat gun shrinking? Uh, so I prep my entire surface before I cover. I am ready for anything internal to be done with this. If I have a control surface, that I am gonna slot with uh, uh, for hinges. When you do this hinge slot, it actually pushes a little piece of wood inside the cavity. And so that would be rattling around inside. And sure. so that's why, that's why I slot the hinge first. Makes sense. Yeah. So I've got my marker here and I'm gonna demonstrate this live on camera. I have a fine tip. It says permanent, permanent. <laughs> Bic permanent, and I am going to do one little stripe right there. See that line right Got there? Mm -hmm. Okay. Isopropyl alcohol. Little bit on, say I use the opposite end of that paper towel, but same paper towel, and look at that. The ink starts to come off. It takes a little bit of doing, but it comes right off. And the also really nice thing about Oratex is that it takes all sorts of paints, all sorts of paints. It'll take acrylic, it'll take uh, any sort of spray paint, any sort of solvent based paint, you know, it, it, it will take it and it will continue if it, the, you know, the paint is thin enough, the texture will also bleed through. As long as you don't cake on the paint, that's really the magic behind using Oratex, in my opinion, in the modeling community. Got it. Makes sense? Yeah. Rick, uh, Rick Rader says using fabric may save some weight because not all the adhesive on the Oratex is needed, which I think you mentioned earlier. Yes, yes. So uh, a, a, a product like SIG Coverall is a, a great alternative to this because, I, I, again, like he said, it doesn't have the adhesive on it. So yeah, looking at this piece, there's all of these squares in here where we didn't need that weight of the adhesive, right? Correct. So building on really small stuff or where it's really critical to maintain that weight that can be a better option, right? Mm -hmm. But again, for the size of model that this is, for the amount of wig area that it is, the expected all up weight, how fast we're gonna fly, I'm not terribly concerned about the weight penalty of this material. It's gonna be very robust, it will have a very long life, and uh, it's gonna allow us to do some really cool stuff with the wings, let me tell you. I'm looking forward to it. <laughs> Well, that's really all that I have shared with uh, are ready to share with you guys tonight. It's it's really these are just basic, simple things. It'll help get you started with your covering. 
Now, there are obviously more challenging surfaces to tackle, such as the wing tips, but you get the gist of it. Uh, when you get to the wing tips, uh, we can we can cover that <laughs> as well <laughs> in, in an additional episode. But really, it's working with your heat gun to heat up the material and then stretch it because it's just like these little tiny corners. You gotta get it hot and then stretch it so that there aren't any wrinkles. And that's really all there is to it. Uh, like I said, it, it's not something I'm particularly good at, sure. but Oratex does help cover your crimes quite well. Uh, ben Harbor said, uh, so if you do Sharpie art on your covering, spray it with a clear coat. <laughs> yes. It would be wise, Ben. <laughs> I like Unless it. you're, I like you know, it. planning to run around with isopropyl alcohol in a, <laughs> in a squirt <laughs> bottle. <laughs> uh, yeah, like but it. like even even if you have uh, different finishes of acrylics, uh, like just happen to what you have on hand. One's a matte finish, one's a gloss finish, and you want to do a clear coat to make it even and even sheen, you can do that without any sort of hesitation or reservation about what is chemically stable with this covering. And you don't have to prep it. It doesn't have to have, you know, other than it being clean. Yeah. It's pretty good. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I like it. Um, Gary said, are you going to share some tips the next time on the wings for rounding the leading edge? Really wondering about that leading edge of wing. Uh, I certainly can. Uh, that is something that I think can be challenging. I can certainly share what works for me. Uh, I will definitely say that that is another aspect of the hobby that I personally feel that that is a trial and error and you have to figure out what works for you, but giving you some recommendations is a great place to get started. Uh, another one that I've, that I've heard asked me a couple of times over the years is how to do uh, wing fillets. So something that we won't be covering on this build, but again, it's, it's difficult to describe because you kind of have to just dig in and, be prepared to fail. And sometimes that happens in the hobby. And that's that's what razor blades are for. You cut it out and you start over again. <laughs> ben Harbor said isopropyl alcohol squirt gun combat. No, Ben. No. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty sure that's against the AMA. <laughs> Rules. <laughs> I know. Safety is overrated, right? Four Eyes had a suggestion, Gary. Just wing it. Yep. <laughs> yep. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a great way to just get started with some basic things. Um, just don't be afraid to know that you're good you're gonna make mistakes honestly i've made so many mistakes and that's how i learn rick said uh he stole your idea of using a square and one two three blocks to cut sticks instead of a miter box thanks if it works for you it works for you that's awesome that's great that's great man it's uh it, that's one thing i will say man uh since we started this all the kind comments everybody's given and uh even uh one of the guys that won tonight i saw his email come through and he said i'm still learning stuff even after 40 years of building and that's why we did this class yeah. so that's that's great it's good to see that yeah. you know and that's why I love going to events and hanging around at the flying field with my club members i love talk and shop and yeah. you know in between flying sessions if if you want to come up to me and talk shop always happy to talk shop because i love learning and and the best way to do it is to have a conversation with a new friend that's awesome yeah that's great it's the camaraderie right that's what everybody oh, yeah. does for the, oh, the yeah. flying is a bonus right yeah no really it is it is. It's it's a it's a facilitator for the friendships that you make along the way. It it really is, because airplanes will come and go. They all have an expiration date. These two models <laughs> I'm building for this, they will eventually die. They they will. Um, 
but the friendships along the way are are going to be well worth the effort you know the friendship that we're getting doing this together brian oh, yeah, yeah. is yeah, one sure. thing but then all the people that we're meeting along the way in the live stream etc is you can't absolutely absolutely no it's great it's great and i i hope to run into everybody down the road it'll be great to uh, sit down and chat so um any final thoughts my friend uh we have one more giveaway don't we we do sure uh we oh yeah i do have that question yes yeah speaking of which here it is in the u.s what is the governing body of the model airplane hobby in the u.s what is the governing body of the model airplane hobby We got an AMA, an AMA, Josh. So this is a technical question. It's kind of a, it's kind of a, kind of a funny one. It's technically the FAA. It's the, there it is, Brian. Brian got it. It is the FAA. The AMA is a community-based organization. There are other community-based <coughs> organizations, but the FAA is the governing body for model aviation. Robert was right behind him on that. Mitch yeah, Gentry man. also. So good job, guys. Very cool. Um, yeah, Brian, Robert, and uh, Mitch, shoot me an email at orders at dubro.com and I will get something special out to you guys. Awesome. So very cool. We uh we will be back to Mondays uh the next master class will be february 12th correct and the reason for that is my fault this time <laughs> february will be on the second and fourth rather than the first and third mondays because of a scheduling conflict with me so i appreciate your your uh, uh acceptance of that i i don't know i don't have an option <laughs> yeah 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 um uh, ben is asking for some lightweight giant scale wheels, almost zero options on the market. We All right. Do so you have those. Go ahead. I'll let you answer you, that. Okay. So oh, um, have you seen any of the airplanes that Ben builds? Uh, I have not. I have not. Okay. So uh, Ben has big, big, big planes. Uh, he, built a quarter scale uh, C-47. Uh, it translates to something like 20 some odd feet. Oh, wow. Yeah, he builds it out of foam and he does a marvelous job and they're absolutely flying kites, uh, but wheels are a real problem. I forget the diameter that he was looking for, but there were like eight or 10 inches, if I recall correctly. Uh, so, <laughs> Ben, you're clever. <laughs> yeah, I'm trying to think. I mean, we have the treaded lightweights that go up to eight inches, I believe. Um, I, but I, I don't know remember. if those are sufficient enough for you, Ben. Um, oh, 12 inch. Yeah, we 12 don't inch. have anything so, 12. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, first world problems, Ben. <laughs> You said, hey, Ben, what about wheelchair wheels? <laughs> yeah, really. Okay, so to be fair, to be fair, my quarter scale Curtis Falcon does have wheelchair wheels. Okay. It does. Um, All right. They're eight, they're eight inch wheelchair, like the front small wheels. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure. Um, the, when I went to replace the tires, when I originally got the model, they were all dry rotted out. To replace the tires, I had to get the uh, inner tubes and the, the tires uh, for wheelchairs. Interesting. So it's not unheard of. Interesting. Hmm. So. Good stuff. Always like to get the feedback of what everybody's looking, looking for, you know what I mean? Oh, someone asked about vintage spoke wheels. Yep. You mean like this? I've done that before. This is all 3D printed. 
Oh, that's this cool. is on Thingiverse. You can download this and make it yourself. There's a jig in everything. I've done an instructional video. Right on. And what is your YouTube channel, Josh? So they can go uh, find that video. Yeah, that's a great question. My YouTube channel is my name, Joshua Orchard. Just do a search Joshua Orchard on, on YouTube and I will come right up. Perfect. Perfect. All right, my friend. I think that's it. I look forward to seeing everybody on the 12th. Josh, thank you as always, sir. Well, thank you, Brian. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. No, no. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> no, thank you. All right, guys. <laughs> All right, guys. We will see you on the 12th uh, back to our normally scheduled day. Uh, thank you, everybody that tuned in tonight. All the comments, the questions, all the great feedback. It's always good to see everybody picking something up from these classes, and we appreciate you all. Um, and I believe, I believe, yes, tomorrow is the, is it tomorrow? Yes. Why am I in 2025? That's not good. I don't know. You're a year ahead. Yeah. Uh, sorry. Yes, tomorrow is the last day. If you guys um, need any products, uh, we did send an email blast out. If you don't get, or if you're not signed up for our newsletters, make sure you go to dobro.com, get signed up for those. Uh, we had a promo code Santa that was good till the end of January to save 15% off your order. So tomorrow is the last day to take advantage of that. So just wanted to throw that out there for all you good folks. I know it's build season everybody's uh, getting everything uh, uh, stocked up in the shop and building the way. So good way to save a couple bucks on your uh, next order. So yeah, man. Josh, thank you, sir. Thank you. All you folks out there. Thank you.